I'm going to be emphasizing the holiness of God, the judgment of God, the justice of God, the love of God, and the grace of God. And you'll find in the scripture that holiness is God's main primary attribute, holiness. And a lot of times we forget that. Many people think love is the primary attribute. But holiness is the primary attribute of Almighty God. Therefore, his love is a holy love. His justice is a holy justice. His judgment is a holy judgment. His grace is a holy grace. And so we're going to be some, seeing some things about God's holiness. A missing note in the preaching today, and I think that's one reason why we are in the state we are in a, this nation, in the churches of this nation, is there's just not enough preaching about the holiness of God. There's not enough preaching about the judgment of God. There's not enough preaching about the justice of God. And the love of God in the right, in the in a scriptural context, and the grace of God. I want you to look here at Matthew 7. We're going to go to chapter 7, and I'm going to read from verses 13 and 14. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Now, <clears throat> here in this scripture. We notice in verses uh, 13 through 27 of Matthew's 7th uh, chapter in, in the Sermon on the Mount, this is the closing section of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was speaking, that there are uh, two alternatives presented, several of them. There's the two ways in verses 13 and 14. That's what I'm going to be speaking to you about this morning. Then there's the two trees in verses 15 through 20. There are the two professions in verses 21 through 23 and the two foundations in verses 24 through 29. Uh, the tree is talking about the good tree brings forth good fruit and so on. The two professions uh, in verses 21 through 23 where it says, Not everyone who says to me in verse 21 of a Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me who practice lawlessness. And so there's the two professions. And the two foundations, of course, we're very familiar with that. The wise man built his house upon the what? The rock. The, rock. the foolish man built his house upon the sand, and we find out how the end was for those two foundations. And so these are two alternatives presented that Jesus gave. I want us to notice now in verses 13 and 14. Now this was a common way of teaching in both Jewish and Greco-Roman thought. They would take two alternatives and present the two alternatives. And uh, we, we find in verses 13 and 14, we'll just read it now, it says, enter by the narrow gate, and, and this is how it says, it enter ye in the straight gate, or narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many be which go uh, in thereat, because straight, or narrow, is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, <clears throat> Christians were called people of the way. There's a church out in the valley called the Church on the Way, a great church. And uh, in Acts, uh, and I can give you the verses if you want to write some of them down, Acts 9 and verse 2, Acts 19 and verse 9, Acts 22 verse 4, and Acts 24 verse 14 talk about the Christians being a people of the way. And here we find that Jesus tells us about the two ways, the broad road and the narrow road. And Christ is both, we find in the scripture, the entrance into the way, and he is the way. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way. I am not the best way. I am not a way. But he said, I am the way. He's the only way. Jesus said, I am the way. He is the way. 
But He's not only the way, He is the door, according to John's Gospel, chapter 10. He is the door that we enter into the way, that we enter into Him. Jesus is the door. Now, He is the way. And this Christian life is a way of life. We talk about a lifestyle. You see, when you really enter into the way, receiving Christ, it changes your life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's why I tell people if they come and they say, well, I can't be saved because I, I, I'm afraid it would change everything in my life. Well, don't worry about that. Receive Christ. Let Him take care of it. If, if things need to be changed, He'll do that. Don't let uh, Satan beguile you or keep you from making that decision of receiving Christ because He will make the changes in your life as you let Him lead in your life. You see, there are two roads, two ways. One road is broad, Jesus said here. It's a super highway. We're very familiar with that in California with all of the freeways, where there are several lanes, many, many automobiles going fast as they can go on that super highway. There's a broad road, but there's also a narrow road the broad road leads to a place called hell. The narrow road leads to a place called heaven. He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. Wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many are on that road, going lickety split, going as fast as they can go. Some of them may think they're having a good time. But that broad road leads to destruction. And he said, straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. It's narrow because there's only one way. Jesus is the way. His name is the only name given among men, according to Acts 4.12. The only name given among men whereby we must be saved. And I want to present to you today... As we look at that broad road that leads to destruction, certainly God does not want people to go to spend eternity in hell. Otherwise, Jesus would never have died on the cross. God would never have given His Son. And it says in 2 Peter 3, 9, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants every person to do. Come to repentance. Turn from that way, that broad road, and follow Him. But God has done many things in my life and in your life, and maybe you haven't recognized it, but today I hope I can help you to recognize it. He has put some roadblocks on that broad road. He has done things in your life and in my life to prevent us from going to a Christless eternity, spending eternity in hell in the place of called, that's called destruction. And I want to give you those five of them. There are, I'm sure there's many others, but I want to present five roadblocks that God has placed on that road that leads to hell. The first one is the Word of God. The Word of God is a roadblock to hell. As you're holding that Bible in your hands today, and as you look at that Bible at home, and as you do your devotions, as you think about God's Holy Word I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way or not, but it's a roadblock. God doesn't want you to spend eternity in hell. And so He's put a roadblock on that broad road to keep us from going there. There are many scriptures that bear that out. For instance, Matthew 24, 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. What do you suppose the world hates the Bible so much? Why do you think that it's been taken out of the public school system? Why do you think there's a disdain in our culture for the Word of God? It's because it's a roadblock to hell. Satan certainly doesn't want people to hear the gospel. The enemies of God don't want to hear pe people to hear the gospel because it has a message. A message of not the tolerance that the world thinks of, you see, you know, 
A lot of people say, man, that's awfully narrow saying there's only one world to heaven. Well, nobody seems to argue with the phone company. If you don't push every button just right, you get somebody else at the other end of that call, don't you? I don't hear people going to court saying, that's narrow. That's intolerant of the AT&T of Verizon. <laughs> and yet people complain. Well, I'm not going to complain. I'm just going to say, well, glory to God. Thank you that there is a way. God didn't have to make a way. I'm not going to complain. I'm going to, I'm going to get, follow him so I don't spend eternity in hell. I'm not going to complain. Thank God he made a way. Glory. And it says in Hebrews 4 verse 12 about the word of God, this roadblock to hell. It says, for the word of God is quick. It's alive. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now you see why people hate the Bible so much. The modern academia, the elitism, those people, they, they hate the Bible because notice what it does. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Sometimes people come to church and hear the word of God preached and they get upset about it. But you know what? I don't have any reason to make you angry at me. I'm just delivering a message. And if a message makes somebody angry, they need to argue with God, not with me. <laughs> God wrote it. He put it in the book, didn't he? This is God's holy inspired word. In Romans 10 and verse 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How are we going to get people saved? By giving them the word of God. We can't convince them. I would never try to argue somebody into being saved. You see? I just want to give them the Word of God and let the love of God, the Word of God, sink deep into their hearts and change their mind, change their heart, and bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. I remember one time hearing about this. Uh, uh, many years ago, it actually took place, but this preacher went to the the home to visit this elderly lady and uh, he's talking to her about the Bible and so on and she wanted to impress him how much she loved God and how much she loved the Bible so she said to her little grandson Sonny why don't you go on to my bedroom and bring me the book that I read so much that I spend so much time in he brought out a Sears and Roebuck catalog <laughs> <laughs> Tell us on her, wasn't he? That's right. But thank God for this book, the Bible. You know, one thing, we ought to have our Bible marked up, you know, where we study it and things like that, but it wouldn't hurt any either. Like I heard an evangelist tell him about, he was visiting this lady and he knelt down. She was ready to receive Jesus. So they knelt down beside the bed and she began to pray. And he had his eyes closed and he heard drip, drip, drip. And he looked over sneaked a peek, and there were tears falling on the pages of the Bible as she was repenting of her sin and receiving Jesus into her life. That'd be great if we had some tears in our Bible too, wouldn't it? Amen. Jesus shed tears. We ought not to be afraid to shed some tears. The Bible is, and I want to spell it out in, in an acronym for B-I-B-L-E. B is beautiful in its language. In Psalm 23, how can anything be more beautiful than that? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It is, for I, incorruptible in its nature. It is the incorruptible word of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 23. About everybody in this life is corruptible. Our body is. Politics is. I mean, all of us. We're corruptible in this old nature, this old flesh. We're sinners. But the Bible is incorruptible in its nature. And then thirdly, B is its blessed and its bestowments. I need all the bestowments that God will give me through his precious book, the Bible, the promises of the word of God. And then L, it's living in its message. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, it's living in its message. And it's E, enlightening in its guidance. He's given me this book to be a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. He, he's given me his book for guidance today. Now I want you to go with me another scripture, and we're going to be coming back to Matthew, so 
keep your place there, but over in Revelation 20, I want you to look at a scripture. Revelation 20, and I'll refer to this uh, throughout the message, but I want us to read it one time. This is in Revelation 20, verse 11, where it says, uh, and this is the Lord Jesus, of course. Uh, John was the, the writer, the human author. He was exiled on the Isle of Patmos as he wrote through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit telling about the judgment of God. Here's the great white throne judgment, which is only for unbelievers. The bystanders and witnesses will be believers, but the only unbelievers are judged here. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and hell, or Hades, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and hell, or Hades, uh, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, that's the permanent judgment, the lake of fire. Hades, the hell is in the center of the earth holding those unbelievers in a place until the great white throne judgment where they'll be delivered up and then cast into a permanent place of judgment, the lake of fire. Now think about this. Those who, have, who were lost, who did not give their life to the Lord, many of them will be standing there before Christ. And he'll say to them, I gave you the word of God. You have no excuse. You could have received my son, the Bible. I gave you the word of God that told you that, that I loved you. And if you'd receive him, that I give to you everlasting life. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. And then let's look at another roadblock on this narrow, or on this broad road that leads to hell. And it is the Christian home. Now this first roadblock, we've all been given the Word of God. All of us have heard the Word of God. You're here in, in this church today. You're hearing the Word of God. So that's one roadblock for sure for you and for me. Now some people have never heard the Word of God. But you and I have for certain. That's one roadblock to hell. Now the second one, some of us have been blessed with, some have not. I was raised in a Christian home. I had a Christian mom and dad. And I was raised, and from the time I was uh, old enough to, to, and they didn't send me to Sunday school or church. They always took me. I never had a choice in the matter, thank God. Most of us, we don't give our children choice to brush their teeth, but then we tell them, you can go to church if you want to or not, which is more important. <laughs> I like to brush my teeth, but I think that it's more important to have spiritual guidance when you look at eternity, what I'm thinking. You know, be consistent. And uh, we as men especially, we need to lead our family by example, and lead them in the right way. But the Christian home is a roadblock to hell in my life. Thank God for my Christian home where I was raised. And, I, and as a result, I heard the gospel. And at six years of age, I went forward in the church, received Jesus Christ, and was saved because of a Christian home where I was brought up in that, the right way. You see, I've been in a lot of different kinds of homes. I've been in, and you have too, more than likely, been in real expensive, big, great big homes, uh, palaces. You've probably been in some of those, uh, Hearst Castle maybe. Some of you might have gone on that trip, seen that, and that kind of thing. We've seen some really elegant type homes. And then some of us have been in some old dumps, you might say, as far as the world's concerned. I'll never forget, I was the first church I pastored, I was just you know, green behind my ears. I, I went to this home and the lady, the cat got up on the stove, was eating out of the can, uh, off the pan or something. So she said, here, you can have that. And she put it down on the floor for her. Now I was, wasn't raised in that kind. <laughs> my parents, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And that was kind of a, you know, kind of a shock to me at the time. <laughs> but we've been in all kinds of different homes. But the greatest difference in a home is Jesus there. Has Christ come to your home. And I thank God for, uh, for Jane and for our children and for the blessings of God. We have, we have four children. You didn't know that maybe, but we have two in heaven. We have four children, but two of them are in heaven already. 
Robert and Patrick are already there. And then John and Susan, thank God we still have them and thank God for our grandchildren. But old Robert, he was quite a blessing and he heard Phil Schuler preach and things of that nature. And matter of fact, Robert, our oldest son, had been called to preach. He had yielded his life to the ministry and he was only eight years of age when he took his last breath at Colorado General Hospital in Aurora, Colorado, there. Uh, and uh, I remember some of the things that happened with him. One time, <laughs> he heard me preaching about the Holy Spirit. And uh, in our church there in Colorado Springs, we, had, uh, we didn't have a restroom yet in the building. We had to go outside down the path for a little while before we got that done. And so one time, he was going to go to the restroom, and he said, will the Holy Ghost get me? <laughs> and he was serious. He didn't know. <laughs> And, and then one time, uh, the church voted to give me a pay raise, and man, he, he said amen louder than anybody else. And I said, man, that's wonderful. Thank God for Robert. And, uh, and then one time, uh, he was at our home, my, my parents' home in, there on the farm, and, and he was asleep upstairs. And uh, all of a sudden, we heard him screaming. And we went to the stairway, and uh, there was a snake coiled up. And he, did, he said, man, <laughs> he was scared to death. And so uh, my, my, as I recall, my uncle had his cane. He went up there and killed that snake. <laughs> Thank God. But, and so we got, but some, before that happened, uh, I think we reached over the snake and grabbed him and took him out over, over the top of it. But uh, it was a scary time. And then one time, and uh, my mom was drying the clothes. And Robert, this was back before they got that safety thing on, he went and jumped in that dryer and pulled the door shut. And she heard something, said it sounded like tennis shoes, going plop, plop, plop. So they opened the door, and all he did was just laying there, he said, hot. <laughs> so he went all through all of those things, did fine, and when the Lord's timing was right, that's when Robert went on to be with him. Then I remember Don Parker, the great gospel singer that uh, we've talked about. He and my brother had a singing group. But Don was telling about when he came home from the Navy, his parents had been writing to him and his, they'd close the letter every time and his mom would close it and say, remember now, son, mom and dad are praying for you. And he gives a testimony as he came and he looked up on the harbor and saw the Statue of Liberty and things. He opened his heart to the Lord and received Christ. That was his testimony. It, mom and dad are praying for you. Thank God for Christian homes. Uh, Timothy said in, first, in 2 Timothy 1, 5, uh, verse 5, he said, uh, and Paul was writing to Timothy, Paul said, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grand, uh, grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. You see, it's that grandparent and that I'm going to talk about next Sunday and the, and the parents that pass on that heritage, how vital that is. We need to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and they see our lives and that will make a difference for them. Well, the Christian home is a roadblock to hell. Some people will stand at that great white throne judgment I was talking about. And they may try to make excuses, but Jesus will say, I gave you the word of God. And in some cases, he'll say, I gave you a Christian home. You had a Christian mama. You had a Christian daddy, but you rejected me. He'll say, you have no excuse. Depart from me that we're connected to iniquity I never knew you. And they'll be cast into the lake of fire, into hell. Well, let's go on to the third roadblock to hell. The third one I want to present to you is the church. The church. This church right here. The church. Everywhere you see a Bible-believing church. That's what we're talking about in an abstract sense. We're saying the church, the local church. It is a roadblock to hell. Now this is an institution that I've been a part of almost all my life. I was around eight years old or so when I was baptized and became a member of the church. First Baptist Church in Akron at that time, but I've been a member of a church ever since. If I moved to another area, I became a member of a church there in that community. And, been, and we've been practiced that all of our 
uh, marriage and our family is so important, not just because I'm a pastor, but uh, we need to be a part of the church because a church is not just a place to attend. The Bible talks about the church being a body. It's a place to be a part of, to be a vital part of that church. God instituted the church. The Lord Jesus established the church. In, in Luke 6, 12, and 13, it gives us the time when he called out the apostles. He had the disciples there, and he called out 12 of them and named them apostles. That was the first office in the church. That's where Jesus established the church. And on the day of Pentecost, the church received the Holy Spirit's power. You see, he instituted only three, uh, three uh, institutions that I can think of. There was the uh, family first, Adam and Eve. God created that first man, Adam, from the dust of the earth. He gave him the wife to be a help made unto him. And the Bible says the two became one flesh. So he instituted the family unit, the home. He also instituted human government. And we tend to make a mess out of everything that God makes for us. The home, the family unit is just unraveling in our society and it has a great effect on the church and on the government the family unit. And so he instituted government. And one of the first things he told government was, people who shed someone's blood, you just take their blood. In Genesis chapter 9, capital punishment. God said, if someone murders somebody, then you're to take their life. And that's one reason why our nation's in a, uh, you know, we need to obviously be sure that the person's guilty. And we have DNA in all kinds of ways. But even then, they put it off for years, and, and by the time they do, if they ever do take them, uh, forgotten about the crime. God help us to get back to scriptural standards in our society. So human government was established by God, and the home and the church. Now, you know, there are a lot of institutions or organizations. There's the Masonic Lodge, there's Elks, there's all kinds. I found out I don't have time for much else other than the church, and uh, I'm a member of the lambs. <laughs> That's the group I'm a member of. <laughs> amen. Glory to God. I came prepared to say my own amens. That's, that I, it keeps me busy. If I'm going to be what God wants me to be with the church, being a good citizen, and the family unit, you see. And Jesus said in Matthew 16 and verse 18, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice that. The gates of hell. The battle isn't at the gates of the church. The battle isn't that hell's trying to come into the church. The battle is the church is at the gates of hell trying to reach people with the gospel, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. We're to be on the attack we're to be on offense rather than on defense. The Lord never gave us armor for our back, just for the front. We're to be on the offense for Christ, the sword of the Spirit. At the great white throne judgment, there'll be people standing there. And Christ will say, you have no excuse. I gave you the word of God. You ignored it. I gave you a Christian daddy or mommy or I gave you... Christian grandparents, and they, wanted, they tried to win you to, Jesus, to me, but you rejected me. And I gave you a church where you heard the gospel, but you said no. You went around the roadblocks on that broad road. Depart from me, that work iniquity, I never knew you. You'd be cast into the lake of fire, hell. And then... The fourth roadblock to hell is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is part of that Godhead. I talked about uh, holiness a little while ago and judgment and justice and mercy or grace and love that are all bound uh, into that great most uh, uh, primary attribute of God, holiness. But there's also the omni attributes of God. There's omnipresence that God is everywhere. There's omnipotence, that God is all-powerful. There's omniscience, that God is all-knowing. 
you see. It's through the Holy Spirit He convicts us of sin. It's through the Holy Spirit He draws people to Jesus Christ. In John 16 and verse 8, in John's Gospel, it says quite a bit about the Holy Spirit. It says these words in John 16 and verse 8, And when He has come, notice it's talking about the Holy Spirit. It says He, not it. The Holy Spirit isn't, isn't an influence. He's a person, but He does have influence in our life. But He's a person. He will re reprove the world of sin. You see, there's some things the Holy Spirit does not tolerate. Amen. There's some things the Holy Spirit is against. <laughs> he says uh, He'll reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then in John 16, verse 14, it says... He, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me. He always points us to Christ. And in John 14, 26, it says, He, the Holy Spirit, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Somebody said, boy, it's hard to understand the Bible. Well, it's not as hard as you think if you have the right teacher. The Holy Spirit's the teacher. He teaches us these things. Now, Pastor John and myself, others who preach from the pulpit, we can give you the, the tools and, and, and teach you these things, but it's the Holy Spirit that ultimately has to teach us for it to stay with us, to really ring a bell and to become part of us. It's the Holy Spirit. And let me submit this tonight, this morning. It's, it's a dangerous thing to toy with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, you better listen because you may never hear from him again if you say no. It says in Proverbs 29, verse 1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. I've known of people, even in this church, I, I can think of one particular person who I believe, and I'm not a judge, but I just believe this, I do have spiritual discernment, who God was calling to preach. And... Uh, he was battling with that, and he said, no. And to my knowledge, he doesn't go to church anywhere. He's, he's unhappy and all that. But, you know, if God calls you, you better listen and better do what he tells you to do. Amen. The Holy Spirit doesn't play games. When he convicts us, when he leads us, we need to listen to him. Amen. In uh, Mark chapter 31, verse 29, But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. Now what does blaspheme mean? It means to say a hurtful word against him. Amen. Blaspheme, the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Now, you hear people all the time cussing Jesus, using the Lord's name in vain. But I'll tell you what, if they use the Holy Ghost's name in vain, they'd be dead really quick. Uh, Dr. J. Harold Smith, who was the vice president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and had a great ministry down in uh, uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, and was on the radio Bible Hour for many, many years. He had a sermon on God's three deadlines. And he said he'd, he used illustration after illustration of people that did this, that said, one of them told him, you take the Holy Spirit, you take that Bible, and all of you go to hell. And they were dead within 24 hours, that person. And he used other illustrations of people who blasphemed the Holy Ghost. It's a dangerous thing to toy with him. But now, hardening the heart goes to the believer. When the Holy Spirit speaks to me, I need to listen. I need to do his will, because if I don't, my heart becomes harder and harder, and I'm, I'm not as likely to say yes to him. My friend, I'm just giving you some truths this morning that we need to consider for sure. Yes, he speaks to our heart, we need to listen. And then the Bible also speaks about those who sent away the day of grace by not doing what God wants them to do, as I read in Proverbs 29. Well, there'll be those who'll say, as they stand before the great white throne judgment, they're going to try to make excuses. God's going to say, I gave you the word of God. I gave you a Christian home. I gave you the Holy Spirit. I gave you the church. I died for the church. I gave you the church. 
but you neglected them, you ignored them, and because of that, depart from me, you that work iniquity, I never knew you. And they'll be cast in the lake of fire. And you and I, as believers, will be observers to this. And that's why later it says in chapter 21, God will wipe away the tears from their eyes. We'll see our loved ones taken and literally cast into hell. This is the word of God I'm speaking this morning. You know, we take parts of it and we really like about the healing and some of those things. Well, we like that. But this is part of it too. Matter of fact, did you know the Lord Jesus spoke more about hell than he did heaven? You read his words, you'll find that to be true. This is serious business. Amen. And the fifth roadblock to hell is the cross of Calvary. Now, when we talk about the cross, we talk about a place where they beat the Son of God, the cat of nine tails. They plucked his beard from his face. They put the sword in his side and out came the blood and water and all that on the cross. You remember how that talked about that? And he said in John 19, 30, three words that ring throughout the halls of eternity. He said, it is finished. When Jesus said those words and he died, Satan's doom was for sure. Yes, Christ would raise from the dead three days later, but when he said it is finished, he died the perfect Lamb of God, holy, taking our, the judgment of our sin, so that we might be justified, that there'd be justice met out for us when we receive Christ. When Christ died on the cross, he paid it all. By his grace, we would be able to be saved. That's where we see the truly love of God when Christ died on Calvary and when he gave up the ghost. Thank God for the cross, for Calvary. That's one of the most beautiful words, and I love to say it. It's just Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. I love to say that, Calvary. That's where he died for us. It is finished. God so loved the world that he gave. You'll see all of those things in John 3, 16, the holiness of God and that primary attribute, and then you'll see the love and the grace and the justice and the judgment in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see all of those attributes there. During the Civil War, at that time, the legislature, the representatives elected the senators. It wasn't like it is now where the senators were elected by the popular vote of everyone in the state. The legislature, the House of Representatives, they were the closest to the people and they would represent the people by electing the senators. And there, was, there were two men involved in this story that I have for you. There was Colonel Smith. He was a member of the House of Representatives. He would vote who would be the next senator from that particular state. And one of the candidates for that post of being a senator was General Gordon. Now, General Gordon had saved Colonel Smith's life during the Civil War. He had scars on his body, on his face, because of what he did to save Colonel Smith's life. Well, Colonel Smith had his ballot for the other person that was the other candidate against General Gordon. And he began to walk down the aisle to put his vote down. And as he looked over and he saw General Gordon, he saw those scars and he stopped and he changed his ballot. He said, how can I do this when this man gave his life or was willing to give his life and had all these scars in the body for saving my life. He changed the vote. <laughs> How about you? When you look over and if you see Jesus today with the scars in his glorified body, 
his open wounds, I should say, in his glorified body where he was beaten for us and he suffered for us. You see those wounds. Will you cast your ballot for him? <laughs> Will you receive him and say, yes, Lord Jesus, I trust you. I receive you into my life. That's another roadblock to that place called hell. The word of God, the Christian family, the church, the Holy Spirit, the cross of Calvary. Stand at that great white throne judgment. There'll be no excuse because God will say, I gave my son. If you're too proud to go around him and try to go to heaven some other way, then depart from me. You that work iniquity, I never knew you. My friend, if, if you try to go some other way, you're, you become a thief and a robber, the Bible says. Jesus is the way. He died for you. And not only that, he was buried and he arose for you. He's that living advocate today. George McLeod said, Jesus was crucified not in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves. Charles Spurgeon said, There are no crown wearers in heaven who were not cross bearers on the earth. And Vance Havner said, We need men of the cross with a message of the cross bearing the marks of the cross. Do you bury in your body the marks of the Lord Jesus, my friend? Paul did, according to Galatians 6, 17. Do you do, do, you do that well as well today? Let's bow for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit would search our hearts and our minds, our lives, and may God be glorified, and may we let, let your will be done in our life. In Jesus' name. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, have you received Christ?